Hi, my name is Han, and I'm the CEO of Lucid. Hello, I'm Vester the Paul. 大家好，我是叶中庸啊，飞佩的创办人兼执行长。大家好，我是 David， 我来自吉雅科技 Glad Cloud。大家好，我是 Henry， 那我们是安创资讯。Hi, I'm Bucky, a founder and the CEO of Monty. At Lucid, we build software technology for cameras to enable them to capture 3D. 那我们公司是结合生物科技、然后人工智慧以及数据，来提供一个女性超越她现有认知的一个保养品解决方案。我们公司是做这个区块链的支付，那就是协助你去收这个比特币、以太币，并转成你要的这个新台币。我们产品 Glass Studio 是透过人工智能进行内容影片产制的一个平台。那我们公司从二零一二年成立到现在呢，一直以来都是主要以做战服为主的公司。I wanted is refer-based recruiting platform, and you can refer your friends, and when they they are hired, then you both have a viewers from wanted. 在大学念音乐的时候，就发现音乐吃不了饭。然后呢，也活不下去，所以呢，就借着之去念了电脑科学。我知道这个反差很大，但是因为电脑跟音乐其实就是我两个极端的最爱。啊、呃，我记得我父亲跟我讲过一句话，就是说他他觉得人生要像海浪一样。那我觉得我在大公司里面工作的话，感觉上是被过度的保护。其实我不太清楚外面到底。世界是怎么样子？其实我我父亲在我十八岁就过世了，所以我们的我们父子的缘分其实很薄。但但是就是他他他跟我讲这些话，我就从小就一直记得嘛。I was born in China, but I was raised in Germany. So most of my childhood I spent far away from my parents and from my family. I wanted to be able to capture the world the same way our eye sees it, which is pretty much in 3D. And being able to share those experiences and memories with family who are very, very far away was one of my biggest dreams, and I think we can accomplish that with Lucid. 2008년도에 이제 석사를 졸업하고 그때 좀 고민을 했어요. 내가 회사에 들어갈까 아니면 나의 사업을 시작할까. 그런데 저는 그때 아직 많은 걸더 배워야 된다고 생각을 했고 그래서 Accenture라고 하는 경영 컨설팅 기업에 들어갔습니다. 어 삼성이나 LG 그리고 SK 텔레콤 같이 굉장히 큰 그리고 글로벌 사업을 하는 기업들과 함께 일을 했고요. 거기서 배운 점은 아이 기업들이 정말 많은 고민을 하고 있고 정말 많은 문제를 풀고 싶어 하는구나. 그래서 프로젝트를 한 20개 정도 한 이후에 생각을 해봤어요. 아 이렇게 세상에 문제가 많은데 어, 나를 위한 문제, 내가 풀고 싶은 문제는 없을까? 그런 생각한 이후에 아무 계획 없이 그냥 회사를 나왔습니다. 开公司是有公司理念，当然公司理念的话就是我相信的东西。那我相信，然后目前还不是对，对世界还不是尝试的东西，然后我才要需要用创业方式来实现嘛。我过往没有经历过亲人过世这个部分，但是一直到我爸也离开了哈，我们才真正感到说哦，人生是有个 timeline， 哦，这个 timeline 是它是有终点。但是我们很多的时候会觉得说啊，改天我们去干嘛？其实这是一个非常风险大的东西，就是说，呃，可能没有下次。我相信所有人要创业，他都是先有先知道要做什么。但是我是先决定我要创业，我再开始找题目。所以其实中间花了蛮长一段时间在摸索的。对，那我觉得那一段的。呃，黑暗时期是最最可怕的，因为你根本就不知道要该往哪边去。创业家很痛苦一点的东西是，你没有办法把问题丢给别人，因为问题是你自己找，你们是干嘛来创业，对吧？绝大多数人都蛮孤独。你在你的 follow 面前，你是神，你不能，你没有悲观的权利，对吧？你去需要去做很多很多的努力，才能够达到你想要做的事情。以前呢。제가좋은기업에다닐때는명함한장만만그줘도제가누군지설명이되고그리고저를기꺼이도와주겠다는사람들그리고저와만나고싶,싶은사람들이많았어요그런데회사를나와서이제막사업을시작하니까뭐그동안제거라고믿었던혹은저의능력이라고믿었던것들이사실은아니더라고요다회사것이었고제가처음부터저의네트워크나
브랜드나 저의 가치 스스로를 만들고 증명해야 되는 일이 있었어요. 그러다 보니까 어, 뭐 세일즈를 가거나 사람들을 만났을 때 어, 이전에 느껴보지 못했던 좀 약간 무시를 받는다고 해야 되나요? 뭐 그런 일들이 종종 있었죠. 因为你的方向是某方面是一定的后面公司这么多人也是跟着你的方向走那你但是你也知道这个东西时时刻刻需要被被挑战的时时刻刻需要调整的那时时刻刻去会苦恼的东西我现在这样做那到底是对还是不对那可能是没有答案要怎么样让公司从那个低潮再慢慢重新爬起来中间其实也是花了很多的时间所以那个时候很多事情就是也就自己看在身上那当然这也就影响到了我的家人影响到了我
然后再投入更多的社会资源，再辅导更多的青年创业家。我觉得这才是一个正向的循环，也是 s p a r i s 台北正在努力的方向。Welcome. It's my great honor to be here to welcome all of you again to Spark Labs Taipei Demo Day 2. I'm Flora. I'm the partnership manager here in Spark Labs Taipei. As Edgar mentioned um, in a video, sorry, I was too touched about a video. Uh, as Edgar mentioned in a video, we have been working very hard to work with our partners, governments, investors, and all the uh, supporters from all over the world to help to grow the entrepreneurs here in Taiwan. Without any of your supports, we cannot go on this far. So many thanks and special thanks to the National Development Fund and CTBC. 特别感谢国发基金以及中国信托，谢谢你们。Now, here, allow me to introduce one of our biggest supporters, start from the very beginning of Spark Labs Taipei, CDBC. And I would like to introduce Tai Denjia, Mr. Tai Denjia, the CTO of CDBC, to give us the opening remarks. Let's welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tai Ten. I'm CTO of uh, CDBC Group. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Spot Lab Taipei team and the uh, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology and the uh, National Development Council. Uh, we feel very exciting. We are together to support this very important Taiwan startup ecosystem. Uh, I also want to thank Edgar. Where is Edgar? Oh, hi, Edgar, my friend. Uh, because he bring the global standard accelerator to Taiwan. I think it's very important uh, for Taiwan innovation momentum for next, next generation growth. So uh, it's also uh, our honor for CTBC to invest in uh, Spotlight Taipei and also become the co-sponsor for Demo Day 2, which is our second time to, to sponsor uh, this Demo Day. So I think today I only have three points about the CTBC to share with you. Uh, first one, uh, we are the largest banking in Taiwan, and uh, right now uh, we roughly have 40% revenue come from overseas. So we are the Taiwan-based financial holding company to target global businesses, just like uh, you are doing right now with uh, Spa Lab. It's a uh, point number one. Point number two, our founder, uh, by the way, I believe there are many founders here. Our founder 53 years ago, uh, he understood uh, the innovation uh, is a key DNA and a culture for the sustainable business growth. So CDBC is first credit card issuer for Taiwan, and uh, we also initiate first internet banking in Taiwan. Uh, we are the first uh, to move ATM into the convenience store to make uh, your banking service easier. And the last year, we also disrupt and uh, redesign our mobile banking called Home Bank. I encourage you, you can download and use it because it can save your time. Then you will have more time to grow and in innovate your business. So it's our one of value for CTBC here. So last point, uh, our CTBC uh, senior executive team uh, want to uh, support you and uh, I believe more star art in Taiwan uh, to succeed. So not only me, uh, but also like Albert Lee, uh, who is uh, our retail banking CEO, we will uh, participate in the mentoring program uh, with uh, Sparlet to support you to uh, get more connection. So we want to contribute here not only the money, but also our experience and the global networking to make you become the, a billion business company just like us. So thank you all, and uh, I uh, look forward for your amazing presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Titan and CDBC support. 
Now we would like to show our sincere appreciation to National Development Fund. Here, allow me to introduce Kirsty Zhen, Director of Business Development from National Development Fund Executive Branch. 让我们欢迎国发基金创业天使投资计划负责人曾美信组长。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Christy from National Development Fund. Uh, it's my pleasure to meet all of you uh, here. And I would like to take this opportunity to make a brief introduction to our National Development Fund. Uh, I would say National Development Fund is kind of government venture capital fund uh, with uh, 46 years of history. Uh, the, uh, the NDF uh, was established in 1973, and our mission is to carry out, uh, to assist the development of emerging uh, industries in Taiwan. So we carry out our mission through four uh, different uh, investment measures. The first one is to uh, direct investment uh, in the company. The second one is to invest in venture capital fund. The third one is to co-invest with VC funds to invest in the company through our uh, special investment project uh, with other uh, Ministry uh, of Economic Affairs or economic, uh, Ministry of uh, Cultural Affairs. And the last one is, uh, the fourth one is loan financing. And we also provide many uh, different investment program for the company uh, with uh, different de uh, business development stages. For example, for a star company, uh, we have angel investment program. We will uh, direct invest in the company, in the startup company, and we also encourage local and global VC to uh, co-invest with NDF uh, to invest in the startup company. And for a company at the early to expansion stage, we, we can offer our direct, uh, direct investment program and the VC uh, uh, venture capital investment program. And so far, we have uh, successfully supported the development of uh, many uh, industries in Taiwan, including uh, semiconductor industries, the biotech in industry, and petrochemistry industry. So the company we have invested, including many uh, uh, worldwide famous companies like TSMC and China Airline and China Telecom and the Gogoro, the, the newly established uh, uh, electric uh, motorcycle company. And in the future, I think, I believe the NDF will uh, play, still, uh, continue to play a role of national spark for investment capital for startups. So if you are interested in co-operate uh, with the NDF, uh, please feel free to contact us. I think we will be more than happy to discuss with you. And for your information, we also set up a booth at this, today's event. So please visit our booth uh, to have a chat with our colleagues to know more about the NDF and our angel investment programs. And finally, I believe the Spotlight Taipei is always a partner, good partner for you, no matter you are a startup or a VC or investors. Uh, I wish the today's event a great success and hope all of you have a very fruitful session and very present stay in Taipei. And wish you all, uh, wish you all health and happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Zhen from National Development Fund. Now, let us welcome the co-founder and managing partner of Spot Labs Taipei, Eka Cho. Woo! Good afternoon, everyone. Again, again, again. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Nice. Welcome to Spark Labs Taipei Demo Day 2. I'm Edgar Cho, the co-founder and managing partner of Spark Labs Taipei. So there's definitely time that you got an idea, but there's no one believes in you. There's time that you have cool product, but there's just no one want to invest in you. You work super hard during weekdays, I mean, for sure, everyone works on weekdays, 
but you go home late, working. You work on weekends, in a coffee shop or in office, like, you know, just work there, working. You work on holidays, having conference calls, meeting users, meeting investors, you are still working. So definitely for every entrepreneur, you definitely face the kind of a, like questions from your family, that are complaints from your family, that what are you doing? Why do you work that hard? When are you gonna to stop and spend more time with family? I know those questions are very critical and tough because I also had, had ever asked this question from my family as well. So I, remem I remember, um, for sure, for everyone start business, it's not easy. So there was one time when, when we started our business, I took the train to Shinzu. At that time, I just exchanged my ID card and get through the security check for three security check and met a CXO. So the, CX, the CSO, after lesson to my product introduction, he asked me, so how many staff you have in your company? How many users you have right now? I say, well, uh, we have seven people in our team, and right now we have like 700,000 users. They say, okay, seven people and 700,000 users. I got really sorry, your product is great, but your team is too small. We had ever worked with a company like you at such early stage. So on the way back to Taipei, I still took the train. You know, entrepreneurs is very, very uh, tough. That we took the train and it's like ping kuai chai, super, super slow train. And it was like chin chang, chin chang, chin chang. I, I keep hearing the sound, it's like, never give up, don't give up. If you give up right now, it's just like, you will, you will have, end up to be having nothing. For sure, that was tough. Our companies, the company I worked before, uh, we target to go global from day one. And Japan was one of the very earliest markets that we targeted. So within like three, three, three days, I finished like two meetings and got the MOU signed from my Japanese partner. I was so happy. Remember, it's just a company of seven people. So I was so happy because I traveled alone. I went to Ichiran Ramen to celebrate. And I ordered extra three Nama Biru. It's like a, a craft beer to celebrate, to cheers the first official signed document from overseas partners. I was so excited. Since then, uh, we start to enter to the market in the US market and also in Southeast Asia and got a contracted partners from Korea, from Saudi Arabia. Right? Those ups and downs are the routine life of being an entrepreneur. As being an entrepreneur, what do you need to start a company? What do you need to start a startup? You need a conviction. You need to strongly believe the things you are doing right now can make the society better. You need to strongly believe the things you are working on right now can make other people's lives better. You also need to have courage. The courage is the inner power from yourself. You can't be afraid of criticism, challenges, and also a lot of failures. You also need cash from a group of strange people investing in you, put money into your company to help you build your dream. But more than that, you also need collaboration. You cannot do it alone. You need to work with many entities, many co corporations, to support you. So at Spark Labs, we always say, it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to raise a startup. Spark Labs Taipei is a VC and also accelerators. We, we support you when you are ready. We support you when you are ready to go global. So we are not just an investor. We also work as a startup. Trust me, we work super hard. And no kidding, super, super hard. Our mission is to help local entrepreneurs to go global. 
We also help international entrepreneurs to land in Asian market through Taiwan. So thanks to our investors, thanks to the event sponsors, thanks to the government officials, and also ecosystem partners, and so many of you, and also including the partners from Spark Labs all around the globe. So at our demo day two, I want to specially thank for Jeff, Carrie, Kai, and also Stephen, who over from the US just for our event. Thanks a lot for your supporting. I'm very looking forward to your panel sharing later on. So today, you can see we have more than 700 people on site, including over 150 investors that came from San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, and also other many places. So as you may know, Taiwan is, a, is the right place for you to start your business. And right now is a good timing. Because as you can see, Typhoon also changed the direction just for us. <laughs> so I hope everyone here can enjoy our demo day. Here I officially announce that Spotless Taipei Demo Day 2 is officially kicking off. Let's get started! <laughs> Today, we're gonna have six amazing teams pitching on the stage, including Arika Security, Beipei, Glia Cloud, Vesser, Wanted, and also Calyx from Sparklips IoT. So, without further ado, let's start the first team. So the team I'm gonna introduce uh, in the next will be uh, Vesser. So I've known Paul uh, three years ago in a good thing, some coffee shop in Guting Station. At that time, he showed me some prototype. He told me that, Edgar, I try to change the world by technology. It might be early, but trust me, I will get there. At that time, there's no Spock Labs Type A, so I can support him like full time with capital and also my resources. But like a few months ago, he came to me again and told me, Edgar, we are ready to go global. We are ready for your challenges. I see the sparkling like from his eyes. I see the hope and I also see the eagerness that from Paul. So without further ado, let's welcome Paul from Vesser. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Paul, the CEO and founder from Vesser. People spend more than 15 billion US dollars in personalized skincare products every year. These products are tailor-made for different skin conditions. However, do users really know about their skin condition? Such Actually, there are 70% of people have no idea about their skin condition, such like oily skin, dehydrated skin or irritation skin. Even though you know your skin condition, your skin still change day by day because of the outside factors like weather, daily routine, or woman periods. So there is no any reason to use the same skincare to fit your daily needs. We have a solution. Let me introduce EC. The latest IoT technology in beauty. You are no longer taking the risk whether the skincare product is effective or not. EC provides a technology that enables you to have a customized skincare every day, every time. To solve the problem, we have a personal use skin analyzer which helps you understand your skin condition in just a few seconds. After knowing your skin condition, we can provide many different formula which adapted to the NSS results. Let's start from the skin data. Most of the skin detectors in the market using image processing to detect the static result on the surface of your skin, like wrinkle, pore, spot. This data is really hard to change in the short time because it comes from pictures, not from tissue. 
our technology diffuse optical tomography, able to detect the dynamic changes of the tissue beneath your skin, which help users know their skin varies every day. Currently, we have 12 patents worldwide and work with many well-known companies like Nivea, Estee Lauder, Beerstove, Lositon, Meitu, and Xiaomi. They use our sensing technology to develop their skincare and evaluate the skincare effectiveness. The product we work with Meitu got more than 2,000 good reviews. The average score is 99%. It's so crazy. People love the product so much. Here comes from our special design app, which able to record, analyze, and recommend the skincare you need. The EC app also capture your, your skin, skin data like melanin, hydration, oxygen level, and sebum level. The app also capture your skin changes over time which help users to know their skin develop in a long period of time. With this data, our AI model able to predict your skin condition and provide the most effective skincare to you. After measuring your skin, you can read the result on the app, which tell you how to adjust the dispenser and get your optimized skincare immediately. The overall process is less than 30 seconds. This pattern system able to provide the right active ingredient to the right skin layer at the right time. We will launch EC in Paris later this year, start from duty-free and in-flight sales. About the pricing, one analyzer with, with skin care cost only 249 USD dollar. We also have a refilled bottle, 59 USD dollar. We currently have a 500K order this year and 1.2 million pre-order in 2020. Remember, this is just for one distributor. Uh, we will expand our market in different countries and channels. We will have two million USD dollar revenue this year and increase 10 times to 21 million USD dollar in 2021. Our investors come from the chairman of Kimpo Group, May2, and Spark Labs Taipei. Our team comes from various backgrounds, including electrical engineer, biomedical, biochemistry, AI experts. We also have a very strong consultant group. Stephen Mo, MIT Rose Scholar, Francesco Chen, WHO representative, Bob Ye, marketing expert, who create a 3 billion cold brew market in the whole world. We are EC. We innovate beauty through data. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm William Chu from Spark Labs Fintech. First of all, I want to say it's, been, it's a great pleasure to be back in uh, Taipei for Demo Day 2. And it's truly wonderful to see the community that the team from Taipei has built over such a short period of time. So congrats to, to Edgar and, uh, and your entire team. This is, this is truly awesome. Um, as I said, I'm from Spark Labs Fintech. So I, I hail from Hong Kong. And we have an accelerator in Shenzhen where we're in a partnership with Ping On Insurance, uh, focusing on three primary verticals. One's FinTech, Health Tech, and Smart Cities. So if you are a startup or you know of a startup that you think um, have an interest to go into China within those three verticals, I would be very, very interested in speaking to you. Now, before I get into introducing the next company, um, let me ask a quick question to the audience. How many here would show a hand own crypto. Okay, fair amount. Now, among those that do, how many of you have actually used crypto in commerce outside of your trading? There's one guy, two. 
So, you know, not surprising because it's not easy, right? There's actually uh, very limited use cases for daily crypto use right now. And the next company, BayPay, is looking to solve that, right? They are looking to provide a, well, they're looking to bring crypto to everyday commerce by providing a truly simple turnkey solution for both businesses as well as users. So if they can solve this, this is a big deal. I think this is one of the key hurdles that's been facing you know, most blockchain and crypto businesses, and this will open up a huge opportunity uh, business, particularly in payments. So without further ado, let me introduce Schofield Ye from BayPay. Hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is Scofield, founder and the CEO of BayPay. BayPay is the blockchain payment service provider to help the merchant to accept cryptocurrency. 2019 is a strong year for Bitcoin. The market cap is already grown three times to a quarter trillion US dollar, and it continues to grow as just Bitcoin alone. And in just six months, there are 8 million more Wally users join the Bitcoin world. You can say there are 40 million users with a quarter trillion US dollar in their pocket. All merchants want to find a way to access this market. Since 2014, there are more and more companies start to accept Bitcoin. In order to access the spending power of the crypto world and enjoy the inherent benefit of cryptocurrencies. With Bitcoin, you can accept payment from buyers all over the world. The transfer fee is less than one US dollar, no matter how much money in that invoice. And thanks to the blockchain technology, no one can roll back your transaction. So there is no chargeback, no fraud. However, there are problems for merchants to fix before they can accept cryptocurrency. Because of the price volatility, they need a system instantly tell them what's their product price in Bitcoin. And uh, help them verify the transactions on blockchain and protect their coin being stolen by hacker and guarantee to sell those coins back to the money they want. So here we create the BayPay to take all the risk above and uh, give the most convenient way for merchants to accept cryptocurrency. Here I do a quick demo. In a coffee shop, your customer want to pay $5 for his coffee in Bitcoin. So you just say $5 here, and our system will show a QR code with the information how many Bitcoin they have to pay, and the invoice only valid for 15 minutes. And your customer use his wallet to scan a QR code to get a payment information and use his private key to sign a contract, send the coin out. And we will help you to verify the transactions on the blockchain. So if everything goes fine, the transaction will be closed in five seconds and the shop get his money in their bank within three days. There are many other cryptocurrency payment services out there. What makes us different from them? First, most of them only do Bitcoin to US dollar. But we can support not only Bitcoin, but Ethereum, stablecoin, and other ICO token, and convert them to multiple currency, like Japanese yen, Hong Kong dollar, Singapore dollar, and more will come later this year. Second, we use machine learning to analyze all the transactions on the blockchain. 
And the mark address, if it's involved with any ransom or hacking event, we will turn down the transaction if our rating system gives it a red light. Third, we help you to create your company coin. You can give incentive to your potential customer or reward your loyal fan. They can enjoy discount and extra benefit while paying your product or service with your coin. Last but not least, we all heard about Bitcoin being hacked and the millions of dollars get lost because the owner failed to protect their private keys. With our wallet as a service, there's no need to worry about the private key. We use the hardware security module to protect your own asset on blockchain. Our business model is very simple. It's free for merchants, and we take 2% from the transaction we make. We started our business September last year, and we got several customers with millions of users in 10 months. We got a couple hundred in our first uh, months. Now we reach 20 times quarter to quarter growth and uh, get a half a million US dollars in transaction volume. At the end of this year, we will reach, our transaction volume will reach 50 million US dollars. And for 2020, we'll aggressively scale up uh, our business 10 times by partnership, our partners and uh, agents in different domain and the country. We already have customers from Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, and uh, Indonesia, but we will extend our business to rest of uh, the country later this year and uh, to Europe and the United States in 2020. Our founder teams are former Microsoft consultants with tens of years experience in delivering enterprise solutions. Our CTO, Kenneth, he lead several blockchain projects in Southeast Asia. We are a strong team with passion and uh, create a scalable, skilled payment system for blockchain. So for those people who didn't raise your hand, you don't have a wallet uh, in the crypto world, please scan a QR code now. Get your first e-wallet. Get into the blockchain world today. We will airdrop you Bitcoin later today, tonight. We are Baypay, your blockchain payment partner. Thank you. Hi, me again, Flora, the partnership manager from Spot Labs Taipei. Uh, some of you know me, I'm actually also an influencer. Uh, you know, I, I produce a lot of the videos to teach people how to cook on my Facebook fan page. Um, so I run this for a couple of years, like three years already. And I remember there's a one time, so one of the publishers came to me and she asked me about, I got a recipes, I got a materials, I got everything. Can you help me to do the video? And I was like, yeah, of course, why not? But which, what, what is the dish, what is the recipe? And she was like, um, it's actually 3,000 recipes. I was like, oh, 3,000, 3, I thought it's just one. So, you know, even if you got all the materials, all the recipes, all the contents already on hand, to produce a video, it still take four to five hours, you know? So it's like 3,000 videos, it's impossible for me, right? But now it's possible. The following team, and I'm going to introduce you, they use AI technology to produce videos at a second and at scales. Let's welcome Glia Cloud. Oh, I want something just like this. Oh, I want something just like this. Hi, everyone. I'm Agnes. CEO and co-founder of Glia Cloud. 
I'm here today to introduce our product, Glass Studio, an AI video creation platform that empowers the media and advertising industry to generate quality videos in a revolution way. If you look at the social media today, you will notice that people today don't read text anymore. They want videos. And that's why the major media platforms, they are taking video content as their key strategy for growth and engagement. However, imagine if you are a news website with thousands of articles published a day. How much do you need to invest to turn all this valuable information into quality videos? So some of them, they bought a video production house worth millions of dollars, while others, they built a 200-people team, start from scratch. So obviously, these solutions are not meant for everyone in the industry because it's neither affordable nor scalable. So that's why we built Glass Studio. With our technology, now every content provider can easily turn their article and other valuable information into videos within minutes at scale. Let's see how do we do it. So here is a long article worth 2,000 words, composed with all kinds of information, such as highlights, data, and user-generated contents. And as a publisher, all you need to do is copy and paste the article URL and leave the rest with us. So within a couple of clicks, a ready-to-use video is generated. All the captioning, all the footage added, the background music, and the charts and tables. Yes, they are made by AI. So now, your reader don't need to spend time reading those long texts, but just a couple of minutes to enjoy the excitement. Well, this is actually happening during the last World Cup season. Glia Studio partnered with Yoku to generate around 5,000 video clips just right in the middle of the game. And other partners include the major video platforms in Asia. We are happy to help them enjoy the benefits of video content with 10 times cost effective, 10 times more time efficient, and some of them even 10 times more monetization power. So everything sounds amazing. Huh? but it actually requires a lot of work. So first, our natural language processing algorithm need to go over the content and summarize them into scripts. Right now, our system support four languages, which are English, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And we are adding more down the road, of course. And then, our computer vision model need to identify the corresponding footage and image. We also have specific trend model for soccer and basketball then everything will compose nicely on our scalable cloud system. And last but not least, this is actually my favorite part. All this machine-generated content, they are well meta tagged which means we are able to optimize them based on the user behavior data. So I want to show you another example for the power of machine learning. Since last December, we started to generate Korean content with you. Uh, TikTok, one of our long-term partners. So given the fact that none of my team really speak the language, sorry, we don't speak Korean, but our AI-made videos, they generate 27 million views in just in the first few months with 100,000 fans. Just as effective as these real internet celebrities. So from 202 solution, last year we are happy to see that our machine-generated content already attract 500 million views last year, and we are more excited to see that we are going to achieve 1 billion views by the end of this year. So the goal is to provide an affordable solution to the industry, we, uh, so any small and medium enterprise, they can pay a monthly fixed fee, 
And we also have an ad sharing model for those who integrate our monetization tool. We are 30 people team now with 70% of technical members. My partner and I, we found the first programmatic advertising platform in Taiwan. And since then, we work closely with the media and the advertising industry and got to know their pain points. There are a lot of labor intensive work, but we believe the manpower should spend on something, should spend on something really matters, like creativity. So this presentation is not about how fancy Glia Studio is. It's more about how we want to use Glia Studio to help the industry turn all your valuable stories into engaging videos, because it is your story that makes our AI technology valuable and meaningful. Thank you. I'm Agnes, our product Glia Studio. Now we are going to have our first fireside chat, the VC trends in Silicon Valley. This time we invited three special speakers from Silicon Valley. They're Jeff, Kerry, and Kai. They, uh, they focus on early stage startup investments, corporate VC investments, and angel investment. So this time they will show a lot of the insights, a lot of the trends that is happening in Silicon Valley. So. Let's all take a brief, uh, deep breath together. And now, let us welcome, given a little bit of time. <laughs> okay. I know you guys are ready, right? So now, let's get your hand ready. Let's give the speaker a big pause. Let's welcome. Let's welcome Catherine, moderator from TechCrunch. And let's welcome Jeff, founder and managing partner from the Uncart Capital. Let's welcome our speakers for Fireside Chat, DC Friends in Silicon Valley. Let's welcome Catherine. Let's welcome Jeff. Welcome, Harry, and let's welcome Kai. Are you the only one lost in the million? Hi, everybody. So today we have um, a panel to discuss both. Can you hear me? That's fantastic. OK. Um, investing trends in Silicon Valley and also um, you know, the Taiwan startup ecosystem, both how it's perceived by investors and in other parts of the world, and you know, what our guests think is exciting about it. So, um, so yeah, let our panelists introduce themselves, starting with Jeff. So hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be in, um, in Taipei for the first time. Um, love the place, kind of hot. Um, yeah. Born and raised in, in France, uh, moved to the Valley 19 years ago, and was one of the first what was then called Super Angels in the Valley and created one of the very first micro VC funds um, as a crazy idea back in um, 2007. And now there's like 850 uh, sort of firms doing the same thing. So it wasn't a bad idea after all. Um, we managed $300 million. Um, we have invested in 218 companies. Some of the most well-known would be uh, Fitbit, even Bright Sandgrid, Postmates, Poshmark, and a bunch of others. And um, excited to be here. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kerry Lai. It's such a pleasure to be here because my parents immigrated from Taiwan uh, to the US in 1966 from Taida. And so I had an opportunity as a little child to come back to Taiwan frequently. And so whenever I get to come back, uh, the food, the people, my family, it's just a tremendous experience. And so it's an honor to bring it back full circle to really help develop the uh, Taiwanese ecosystem. So what a, what a great honor to be here today. I had the uh, unique opportunity, uh, similar to Jeff, to uh, found my own venture capital firm called Conductive Ventures. And the video that was played earlier, I can relate 100%. Uh, I can understand the emotional turmoil, the 
highs, highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. I can understand the loneliness, the people calling you crazy for leaving a, what was a wonderful job. And you know, those, those late mornings and, and late nights where you're thinking, am I, am I, am I crazy? Because everyone keeps calling me crazy. And so I, I, you start wondering if, if that's actually you. And to understand that whole entrepreneurial journey uh, is, is quite, quite amazing. So I applaud every one of you who actually had the bravery and the courage to not just do what you think you should just be doing, but actually doing something that you know in your heart and your mind that you should be going after. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Dajia hao. Uh, my name is Kai Huang. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and an angel investor. Um, I spent most of my career in gaming. Um, I started a company called Red Octane, which was best known for creating the game Guitar Hero. Um, our company was acquired in 2006. I stayed with our acquiring company for a few years. Um, and ever since then, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, so uh, I love starting companies and building companies, so I continue to do that. Um, I angel invest, and I also love working with uh, startups. So I do a lot of work with um, startups, both here in Taiwan and in the US. Okay, and I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Catherine, I'm a writer for TechCrunch. Um, I'm based in Taipei, but obviously TechCrunch is based in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, so it's kind of like an interesting, it's been an interesting vantage point to look at um, trends, but I want to ask, the three of you, just in terms of currently um, startup valuation funding trends in Silicon Valley, particularly for early stage startups. So there's been like coverage about how, you know, there's seed funding has increased, like seed rounds are larger, but then series A rounds, they're larger too, but they're also coming later. Um, I was wondering if that has been the case. Have you observed that? Is, has that been the case in your experience? And also um, just in terms of early stage, Funding, like, what does that mean for um, startups that are just starting out? Because I'm sure that's like, you know, most of the founders in this audience and aspiring founders are, that's where they are right now in terms of their companies. So there's been a number of, of uh, growing trends uh, over the past two, three years. Um, one, the mega rounds. So for the first time, we had 60% uh, of the rounds uh, in the US last year were over 50 million. Uh, we passed $100 billion in, um, in funding. And, um, you know, my perspective is I, I used to write the 25 to 50K check that got company started back in, you know, 15 years ago. And at the time, a funding round, which was very hard to put together, was a few hundred thousand dollars. Now, I think our average uh, round size for what we've done last year was uh, three point something million dollars with us contributing 1.2 million dollar. Mm -hmm. And uh, candidly, most of our um, investments are still in the valley. And the reason why you uh, have a three point ish million dollar round is that, you know, the cost of building companies and renting space and um, uh, hiring resources has kind of doubled in the last three, four years. So you have all this competition that we have uh, a, because of the sheer number of startups that we have in Silicon Valley, but also the fact that the Googles and Facebook and Ubers and Dropboxes and all those companies going public are still sort of hiring engineers by the hundreds. And there's just a fierce competition um, for talent because A, we don't produce um, enough engineers. B, because of the kind of stupid um, uh, immigration policy of this uh, administration, which has shut down uh, sort of visas and everything, it's no longer feasible for us to import engineers from the outside. And so the competition has just uh, made Silicon Valley essentially crazy expensive to build startups. Yeah, I mean, come to Silicon Valley and you'll meet a bunch of engineers who get paid two, three, four hundred thousand and they'll feel like the poorest people in the world. It's, yeah. it's kind of ridiculous. It's because housing costs more, food costs more, uh, everything just costs more. And so ultimately that trickles down to how much companies need to raise in order to continue to grow their business. And Jeff's absolutely right. You have to compete with Google who has you know, more than $100 billion on their balance sheet and they don't mind paying half a million, a million dollars for engineers because they'll make that up in the next quarter, in the next few days easily, a few hours. 
And so I think one of the biggest trends, at least for our firm, is you know we're, we're a humble $100 million fund, and we've actually been looking outside Silicon Valley. We believe that you're gonna be able to find talented technologists, entrepreneurs, outside of Silicon Valley. And so we've invested in Boston, Austin, New York, and Chicago, uh, in other places where, you know, more, where my partner and I are more than willing to jump on a plane um, and visit companies outside of Silicon Valley, where we believe we can get better pricing, better value, but the same hungry entrepreneurs. And I think that's similar in Taiwan as well. Yeah, I would echo what uh, both Jeff and Carrie said, that the costs in Silicon Valley have just ballooned, right? Which means everything goes up. Um, the costs are high. The cost of getting people is high. The cost of starting a business is high. So that's caused companies, startups, to have to raise more money. Um, at the early stages, the valuations, I mean, in my opinion, it's completely out of control. Um, as an angel investor who's looking you know, at startups, I mean, the valuations have gone up so much higher um, over the last five years that, um, you know, it, it, it feels like you're having to go to different places to find, you know, better opportunities. The deals are still there, um, and great companies and great people are still there, but you just have to be much more selective. The one thing that I, you know, would caution, you know, founders is that as a founder, it's always great to have a very high valuation for your company, right? That's, that's good for you and that's good for your investors. But the one thing that I see quite often, um, which I think is a challenge, is that when your valuation starts really high in the early stages, um, if you know, you're twice sort of what a normal, what we might consider a normal valuation, all of a sudden that starts to set you down a path where your next round has to be higher and your next round has to be higher and your next round has to be higher, right? So although as founders we love to have high valuations, I know I did when I was raising money for you know, my company and the companies that I've worked with, um, sometimes raising money at too high a valuation uh, becomes a bigger challenge for you down the road. It might be great today, be, but it becomes a bigger challenge for you down the road. Yeah, so that um, about valuations, that leads into my next question, which is that um, as Series A rounds come later and they're bigger, they're coming at higher valuations and you know, so on. I was wondering just over the past few years, have you noticed a shift or an evolution in the kind of criteria that investors use to evaluate whether or not a company is ready for their next stage of funding? Has it become more specific? Um, I, you know, I, I was wondering if you could tell me just what you've seen in terms of how startups are evaluated. Well, I think it's it's kind of the I, I completely agree with um, with Kai. The, the issue is if you if you anchor high on your valuation because you raise a um, a large round, it's always you know. A, a, uh, a triumvirate of, or trio of valuation, dilution, and size of round, right? So when you raise a three million dollar round, you're going to try and get it with a post money in the teens, because otherwise it's going to be too dilutive. The problem is that if you post in the teens, that means that your Series A has to be in the 20s to 30s, which means that to get there, the hurdle that you have to clear uh, or hurdles are higher. So that means more revenue, more traction, more customers, more logo, more data. And so over the past few years, you've seen the you know, seed rounds become the old Series A, and the Series A now is kind of the old Series B, and so on and so forth. And what companies have to show for, and I think our average Series A last year was $12 million. So you know, to get to $12 million check, you have to sort of put a bunch of points on the board that gets investors to be comfortable writing that size check and take the risk that they are sort of taking. Um, and everything sort of ripples, right? And then at those mega round stage uh, or super growth stage, you have the uh, Vision Fund and a few others who are trying to write 50, 100 plus million dollar check with also sort of a set of hurdles that kind of compress the ecosystem. And the craziness that Kai was referring to is because you have a, um, imbalance between supply and demand where there's just too much money chasing too few deals and when people sort of want to try and get in the deal they will try and pay a higher price. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and I think one of the side effects of raising too much money is this uh, what I'm seeing more is a lot of companies are raising what's called a tweener round so you're in between what traditionally was a B if you raised an A and you want to raise a B 
but you don't have the fundamentals, the metrics, and whether that's a bookings number, a uh, number of customers that you have, a revenue number, you know, whatever your kind of business is, you don't have the growth metrics, you haven't grown into it, then you're often starting to raise a tweener round, which is usually like an A1 or some kind of B or B1. And that can be uh, a challenge uh, for companies as well because there aren't that many firms that are willing to lead tweener rounds. And then you start going down this uh, downward spiral of, well, why aren't your insiders supporting you? Why aren't you able to produce these fundamentals? What went wrong? Uh, and how much time are you going to take to build that momentum again? The other side effect that I see is there is just so much pressure in the valley. You read on TechCrunch and other uh, you know, media of, you know, this company raised money at this, this crazy valuation, and all of a sudden, if they're in your space, as, an, as a CEO, you're thinking, gosh, I've got, gosh, I've got to go raise some more money now, too. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with all that money, but I'm going to go out and raise the money anyways. Because if I don't, then I look weak, and then no one's going to fund me. And so it's just this perpetual bad behavior of just raising more and more money, even though they don't necessarily need it, valuations get crazy, and then everyone's going down this, this spiral of everyone just throwing money when it's not necessarily the healthiest thing to do. I think that's called a bubble, right? <laughs> Um, your bubble. Yeah. So it, I, I, again, I agree. I think the um, the bar for Series A has gotten so much higher now, um, from you know what I've seen three or four years ago. Even the metrics, um, the data that you have to collect, and so what that means for entrepreneurs is that you know you're you're working your butts off, but you got to get traction really, really quick, right? You don't have the luxury of saying hey, I've got two, three, four, five shots on goal to try to figure this out. Like you have a very short one runway to figure these things out. And that, again, is part of all the pressure that's, that's, that's kind of happening when, when all of these sort of, um, uh, the timelines get compressed where you have you know, competitors, you have um, resource constraints um, you know, and, and capital. So the bar's definitely you know, gotten a lot higher um, in some ways, that's good because the startups that survive, um, you hope, are the ones that are going to do well. Um, but that certainly makes it a much more challenging environment. I mean, we, we often forget the, um, that fundamentally what you're building is a business, right? Um, uh, a few days ago, we, um, we had one of our companies acquired. Uh, it was a, a P acquisition, actually. So uh, Blackstone uh, took out uh, Vungle, which was an ad tech company. Um, for a um, price which was supposed to uh, uh, remain uh, confidential, and then TechCrunch mentioned the price, which was $750 million. Um, and the company hadn't raised more than 25 or $30 million, and we hadn't raised for five years. And in the, in the eyes of a lot of people, it was because the company wasn't doing well. Well, it was just, you know, making a lot of revenue and throwing a a lot in profits, and so it just didn't need to. And so we have this weird uh, kind of connection between, oh, they're raising, and so they're successful, as opposed to, oh, they're not raising because they're building a real business, and they actually don't need to. So, so one of the one of the key values of of our of our firm, if you go to our website, is being uh, budget conscious. And it's not just because my partner and I are super super frugal. Um, but it's because we really want our entrepreneurs to embody that. And so we actually have this um, efficiency ratio that we look at internally to our firm, and we, we call it um, basically early efficient growth metric. So what that means is uh, how much capital you've raised cumulatively to where you are uh, in your growth metric. And that could be a revenue number, a bookings number, um, and we're looking, at least for SaaS companies, uh, for software SaaS companies, we're generally looking for a one-to-one -one ratio. And what that means is if you're a SaaS company, enterprise SaaS company that's raised $10 million, we're hoping that at a minimum, you're at a $10 million run rate or you've achieved 10 million and you're gonna be going to 20. Uh, the reason why we really care about that metric, you know, to Jeff's point, is because I've seen too many enterprise software companies who are looking to raise their next round of funding, and they've raised, let's say, a total of $30 million, and they've produced $1 million in uh, revenue. And I'm looking at them saying, the hell did you do with all that other money? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Parties. I was basically wondering, just in terms of, um, you know, 
more hedge funds getting into um, startup funding. I was wondering, how do you think that's affecting the ecosystem, you know, both for venture capital firms that are investors and for the startups themselves? Well, I think it's the, so in a, uh, in a world where um, you have uh, very low interest rates, at least mm -hmm. in the US, and you have, you know, no okay key performance, actually the, the financial markets aren't doing sort of too bad, uh, stock market isn't doing too bad, but they were just l looking for, you know, um, alpha and performance. And so the hedges have come in, the hedge funds have um, come in and started to do uh, those growth rounds. Uh, Kotu is, you know, comes to mind. You have also the, um, uh, the, pension, the pension funds are getting active. So all the very large asset managers want to um, get into the growth game. And what that has created this is sort of delay in um, the exit market where you have so much growth capital available to you, you don't need to actually go public until either your investors are kicking and screaming or you feel that you're ready. The problem is that by that time, you may very well uh, be too late because you don't have enough growth left in the company's trajectory to um, uh, sustain the public market position. So it's, I actually think that companies, sh companies should go and get into the public market sooner, but as soon as you know, they want to, um, they don't even want to raise money, money is available to them, there's an armored truck you know, uh, in, the, in the street waiting for them to uh, express any sort of need. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out, because once you're too late for the public market and there's no one there to be big enough to buy you, you're kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, just with the rest of the panel, I want to kind of talk about, just start kind of explaining the questions beyond Silicon Valley, um, because, you know, backstage we were discussing just, you know, um, right now people are starting to look, you know, you were telling me, for example, Jeff, you were telling me that they look for, comp they used to, the company's entire, the building of the company would all be Yeah, basically, the, the, it's what's, what's really weird is, we used to bring everyone to Silicon Valley yeah. because it was sort of the most efficient platform to attract financing, uh, get engineers, and scale fast. But now we're at a point where the competition is so fierce and so expensive that everyone has flipped 180 degrees and is trying to push companies to scale outside of Silicon Valley. So now, when one of our companies, so we, we still build everything on the one roof, uh, during the seed stage, but at Series A, we have a discussion about either moving mm -hmm. engineering products somewhere else, op opening a second center, going partially distributed or fully distributed or anything essentially which avoids competing with Google and, and Uber and Facebook who can pay half a million dollar for an engineer and I can't, right? Yeah. What that means is second degree uh, kind of order, well, we are now actually looking for companies that have product and engineering somewhere else, mm -hmm. and go to market in the US. So for, for us, uh, we, you know, it's a team of three, and, and we are really good at one thing, which is getting companies to um, a Series A with Silicon Valley players. And so we think that go to market and CEO will have to be in Silicon Valley or New York or Boston. But engineering literally can be anywhere. And in the last six, is it 12 months, we've done product engineering in Israel, in um, uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, in uh, Dublin, Ireland, um, Barcelona, Spain. Um, and so it's really sort of an awesome opportunity for a bunch of ecosystems around the world because we're not the only ones who will actually do that. And that's just gonna open up the, um, the opportunity to way more ecosystems than, than you know, in the last 20 years. Yeah. So we've seen, oh, I'm sorry. Karen. So I was just gonna say, one of the reasons why I love the, the motto here at Spark Labs is to go global. Mm -hmm. And in the US, there are so many great things that have come from Taiwan, like Bing mm -hmm. Taifeng, yeah. and mm -hmm. Basu Du Si, yeah. uh, Share Tea. And so I do believe that there are wonderful entrepreneurs in Taiwan that can translate beyond just food uh, and go into uh, applications, services, software. I mean, Taiwan has had just an amazing, uh, so my uncle was a technical co-founder of a semiconductor company in, uh, down in Texas called um, Dallas Semiconductor uh, back in the 1980s. And Taiwan had this amazing run 
of hardware companies, you know, from Acer to Asus and to, to all these companies even, um, you know, and so I do think that that can carry on. But I think one of the biggest challenges as well that faces not only uh, Taiwanese, but also even Taiwanese Americans is uh, the ability to have the appetite for risk. Um, you know, when my parents left Taiwan, you know, and what they wanted for their kids was, uh, you know, the, the typical traditional Asian parents in, in the US, right? Uh, was to become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Entrepreneur was about the same as being unemployed. <laughs> and because there's this fear that the more risk you take, the bigger chance of failure might occur. And that is so true, but I think you learn the most when you fail. And you know, I think for a lot of you know, my parents who came from Taiwan, uh, and, you know, sacrificed a lot, you know, because they never came back to Taiwan after they left after 1966. I mean, they came back to visit, but they never came back and lived here. That, I just think about that. I'm just so incredibly grateful um, because having grown up in the U.S., um, I can see the opportunity to uh, embody and embrace new ideas and a bigger appetite for risk. And so... I definitely applaud every single entrepreneur in here again, because I know what it must take to tell your parents that you're leaving this wonderful job, this stable job, uh, what it takes to tell your spouse that you have this wonderful idea, but you're gonna quit your job <laughs> to do it. I've been there, and trust me, those aren't easy conversations to have. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen, and I've I've built companies in the U.S. and I've actually done another startup where I've used teams in Taiwan. Um, and one of the things I think that you're seeing generally just globally is the, you know, the, the talent level has risen a lot higher. We kind of live in a bubble, as I said, in Silicon Valley. So, you know, we feel like the talent is great there and it is. Um, but as Jeff was saying earlier, the ability to hire teams and compete against the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apples and, of the world and the, you know there's so so much great talent there but the competition is extremely high so you know whereas three five ten years ago it was frowned upon to maybe build teams outside of Silicon Valley in fact now if you can do it it's a structural advantage right not only do you have the ability to generally speaking build lower cost teams but you also have the ability to access talent which is quite difficult to do um, in Silicon Valley. And, and so the advantages there then become that in the rest of the um, ecosystems around the world where you know, companies are building teams and then these people leave those companies eventually if they you know, exit and then start, um, they start their own companies, those, those people go on and start their own companies, that's definitely one of the things that um, I think you're starting to see um, you know, everywhere outside of Silicon Valley, which I think is great. And, and, and we're seeing that here in Taiwan as well. I think the, um, the opposite, right, the, the, the two factors I would mention, one is um, when you go and build uh, teams remotely, you will get some kind of an economic sort of discount. But since everyone is actually, you know, tapping the Toronto market or Vancouver or uh, Waterloo, you will have Silicon Valley pricing competition. But the thing that you will, the benefit you will get is retention. Because now in the Valley, people sort of build their own mini portfolio. So they spend a couple of years at a startup, move on, a couple of years at a startup, move on. So that in 10 years, they have, you know, four or five uh, options that maybe sort of will get them a, a great outcome. And the problem is that um, I think even Facebook is at 2.8 years average in terms of tenure. Uh, Google is slightly better at 3.2 years, but it's nothing like you need, because you need lifers, people will spend six, eight, 10 years with you to really build you know, the infrastructure that you need of a um, scalable startup. So retention is also sort of a really big thing. So we have a few minutes left. Um, so basically like the last question I wanted to ask was I think something that maybe a lot of um, 
founders or you know people thinking about founding their own startups in Taiwan are curious about because you know like we talked about Taiwan is definitely known for its you know its engineering talent um, R&D you know Google opened its R&D park here it's definitely known for hardware OEM um, so you know it's in terms of companies looking for talent and to expand Taiwan Taipei Taiwan is I mean you know the country is certainly attractive for them, but I was wondering, um, you know, because like Carrie said, there are some cultural challenges to, um, you know, risk taking and, and everything, um, and how risk taking is perceived. So, you think? Do you think even though tai Taiwan is known for having a lot of talent, um, what room does that leave for startups to actually launch when you know when companies are coming here to look for? talent and there are cultural issues at stake too. Yeah, I think, um, and you know, it's not only with Asian parents. My father, when I told him I was going to do a startup, he looks at me and goes, I don't understand, you've always had good grades. <laughs> anyway, um, that was a long time ago. I think the, this notion of, oh, you are in Israel, so you're going to do security, you're in Taiwan, you're going to do, you know, microprocessors or whatever, is a concept which is kind of long gone. If you look at Los Angeles as a, um, uh, an ecosystem which has become really vibrant and very diverse in the last, you know, five years, you go there, you find pretty much, you know, a mixed bag of anything. And so I would, I would really encourage uh, people in Taiwan to just forget about whatever you're well known for. Um, and just if ever you have a brilliant idea, want to build something in, you know, direct to consumer in, you know, SaaS or whatever, just go for it because the world has really sort of gone global and recognizes that you can build awesome companies pretty much anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. yeah. I always tell people that I'm the accidental entrepreneur. And I say that because never in a million years did I even think that I would be founding my own fund. I was super happy at the firms that I was at. I was at IVP, super well-established firm, been in the Valley since 1973, and Intel Capital, one of the world's largest uh, global corporate venture firms. And I was super happy and I was making really great money. But really at the end of the day, when I started to look around, there was a lot of things that I wanted to do differently. And one day, either when I'm done with VC or VC is done with me, I wanted to have my own imprint on, on the entire ecosystem. And that's why I left and that's why I decided to, to found my own firm. I think that is what embodies, I think, the entrepreneurship in Taiwan. It's just about starting. That's usually the biggest step and the biggest leap for any entrepreneur, is having the risk appetite, the hunger, the guts, and the ability to say, hey, I'm just going to go do it. And I think once you start that momentum of saying, I'm going to do this, and then this, and then the next day, and the next day, you start building this forward momentum, and then one thing just leads to another. Yeah, I think that forward momentum is definitely something I see in the ecosystem here. I've been sort of loosely tracking the Taiwanese startup ecosystem over the last 10 years. Um, and I come back to Taiwan maybe once a year or so on average. And every year I come back, I talk to, I try to talk to startup founders and, you know, what's going on and what's interesting and what's new. I'd say 10 years ago, it was pretty thin. There wasn't a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, and I would say over the last three years, I've seen a lot more activity. And actually over the last year, I've seen an incredible explosion in activity, which I think is very exciting. So, um, you know, that's very encouraging to me that the perceptions are changing about, you know, what it means to become a startup entrepreneur. You know, it's okay to fail and it's okay to take risks. Um, I think, you know, all, all different organizations from governments to businesses, to accelerators, um, you know, to startup founders. Um, I think there's just a lot more excitement around, you know, what it means to build companies and work on startups. Um, so hopefully, you know, that, that acceleration um, continues. Okay. So I think that's all the time we have. Okay. Thanks, Jeff, Kerry, and Kai. Thanks for taking your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone feeling now? Got enough caffeine in you? You ready for the afternoon? That's it? That's not enough caffeine. Did too many people have so much of the cider and beers that you've now lost some of your energy? Get excited because there's a lot of great presentations coming up. Um, so I work as a mentor for Spark Labs across Korea and Taiwan. And, but in my day job, um, I work with governments, um, including Taipei. Um, I work with technology vendors and enterprise customers on the next wave of technology. So things are on the Internet of Things. So to give you an idea, over the last couple of years, I've looked at well over a thousand companies in IoT. And in a little secret, they're not all that great. Um, there's some really cool things, but you always want something that wows you. And they're not always out there. So about six months ago, I was in a meeting um, up in Spark Taipei 101 with my friend's company. And she pulls me in and she's like, come on, you got to go meet this guy. And she takes me in to meet our next presenter. And he started explaining what he did in his background. And my eyes started getting really big. And I think my comment was, seriously, you can do that? And um, I was really wowed by it. And it was quite impressive for me because I'm like, this is neat. And literally, as soon as I walked out of the room, I went back to my computer, typed out a bunch of emails to my contacts back in Singapore. I'm like, you got to check this guy out. Um, this, what this company can do is really innovative. So when Edgar asked me to introduce him, I was honored to do it. And I'm not going to tell you about the company because I'm not smart enough. I mean, honestly, the stuff he does is quite amazing and inspirational. So I really got a kick out of this guy. So please, everybody, welcome Ray from Calex. Hello, I'm Ray. I'm the founder and CEO of Calex. At Calex, we explore the power of our materials to deliver smart and customizable sensing solutions. Today, sensitivity, specificity, and durability are the, th are the key three features composing a next generation sensors. They must be sensitive enough to cover large spaces selective enough to be able to recognize distinct compounds in a complex environment, and durable enough to last multiple years. However, when we first came into the space, discovering the world of commercial gas sensing, we found that most use cases still face the same challenges. And this is because some of the sensors are highly sensitive, specific, but lack in durability and some of them are just highly durable. They can meet one or two of the features, but never three of them. At Calix, we have a revolutionary technology that does just that. We provide high-performance sensors for single gases and are introducing a solution for complex aromas. We offer sensor evaluation kit that come with the computer port and tubing connectors. So you can introduce the gas all the way straight into our sensors and then see the sensor response right from your computer monitor. And then from there, the signal will go up and down, reflecting the concentration levels of the gas. This is to help our customers better understand our technology. Here is our core sensor module that meets industry standards for embedded system. This is suitable for most industrial applications. And this is our fully assembled sensor system with wireless and battery support, ideal for the standalone and network operations. Our Roma analyzer is built using Calix proprietary technology. It can be customized to sense complex gases based on our unique Aroma fingerprint in the AI Aroma library. And here's the technology behind our sensor. Our sensor relies on biomaterials that we engineer to color shift in the presence of a target gas. And the color shift is fully reversible, so which means the sensors can go through thousands of cycles without any performance degradation. We custom engineer biomaterials whose protein receptors bind specifically to the target gas. This allowed us to distinguish similar compounds without any interference. We even use biology to amplify sensor signals, allowing us to make sensors 500 times more sensitive than alternatives. 
This is a technology based on the decade of research at UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, leading to a patent filing of our innovative approach. And Calix has the global exclusive license right of the IP. We are first targeting the whole vertical of industry gas sensing market, which is a $9.5 billion market. And by including the, glo uh, the global market of gas sensors and analyzers, we are looking at a total addressable market of $18.8 .8 billion with a fast growth rate, 11% annual growth rate over the next four years. So sensor networks is not just a vision. This is happening right now. And I'm so thrilled to share with you that we've launched our products two weeks ago at Sensors Expo 2019 in San Jose. We already moved from pilot trial stage We already moved from pilot and trial stage to mass production of the sensors. And we plan to deploy hundreds of the sensors in the field with current customers. That includes the two largest utility companies in North America for the natural gas leak detection, and the world's largest insurance company for refrigerant leakage monitoring in cold storage warehouses. And our sensors are also being used by the international HVAC system company for commercial buildings. And on top of this, we have two advanced projects to tackle so-called hybrid problems that the commodity sensor cannot easily compete with us. The first one is to detect biomarkers for consumer health. This is working with the Fortune 100 United States Consumer Goods Company. Another one is for food aroma analysis, working with the largest food and chemical company in Japan. Our business model includes one-time sales of sensor modules and systems, or just the sensor chip itself. This is depending on customers whether they want Calix designed units produced by our OEM partners, or they can just license our specialized engineering design and then build the units themselves. We also provide hardware leasing and software substitution model for customers doing smaller scale deployment. To generate recurring revenue, we upsell our premium features in advanced analytics, such as predicting maintenance and risk prioritizations. This combined model ensures easy adoptions, continuous revenue stream. I have a strong team to support this mission. We have 17 full-time employees and three co-founders. Benz and I have been working together on this technology for more than seven years. And Jimmy has more than 20 years' experience in system-level hardware design. Our lead advisor is Peter Shi, the founder and CTO of Ray System, a leading global gas detection company that got acquired by Honeywell back in 2013 for a price of $350 million. We have Dr. Rom Shinoi, who is the former CTO of ConocoPhillips, the world's largest oil and gas service company, and the former advisory board to the US Secretary of Energy. We also have the former CEO of HP and former VP of Oracle on board as our business strategy advisors. So with our huge universe of the receptors, over a trillion entries, we can develop new sensors more quickly and more economically than existing sensing technologies. So we can get into new untapped markets really fast such as agriculture, health and environmental monitoring, or food and beverage quality. These are all billion dollar size market, and we already have plans to penetrate this market in the next five years. We are fully committed to commercializing our phase technology for complex gas sensing and building the world's first AI aroma library. So come join us in our journey to make our world safer and smarter. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Angel. I am the program manager here at Spa Labs Taipei. I would like to introduce you to Gloria from Wanted.
good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gloria Lee, and I'm the head of global business at Wanted. Everyone agrees that the best way to meet someone is through referrals. When it comes to dating, 54% of people say that referrals are key to meeting the right person. In business, 90% of people say that they rarely respond to cold calls or cold emails. What about in recruitment? 98% of employers trust referrals over any other recruiting channel. Our data tells us that candidates are eight times more likely to be hired with a referral than without. Yet companies still rely on traditional channels like online job portals and very, very expensive headhunters. Why? Because motivating someone to make a referral is actually not that easy. Referrals take a lot of time and energy. And what do you normally get in return for making a referral? A word of thanks, a cup of coffee, maybe a meal? But things are different now because Wanted is here. Companies post jobs on Wanted, and people can refer their friends and colleagues to jobs for a cash reward. Sounds pretty easy, right? Now, how does Wanted work? Let's have a look. When you go to the Wanted app, you'll see that there's lots of cool jobs from cool companies. Let's check out this job from Deliveroo Taiwan, for example. Um, to see a detailed job description, you simply need to click on the job card. And as you review the job description, you'll notice that you can earn 20,000 NTDs for successfully referring this job. The candidate who gets the job also gets another 10,000 NTD. Now, let's say that you think of a friend someone that you worked with, someone that you know very well, whom you think would be perfect for this job. To share the job, you simply click on Share, select the chat app that you'd like to use. Let's say you want to use Line. Clicking on Line will open up your Line app, and from there, you simply send the link to your friend. From there, let's say your friend Tina, all she'll need to do is click on that very job link, and she can review the job description herself. To apply, Tina will simply need to click on Apply. And when she gets to her job application page, she'll just need to review her personal information, make sure that you're selected as a referrer, upload her resume, then submit. And voila. Tina's job application to Deliveroo Taiwan has been submitted. A few weeks, maybe a month down the road, when Tina is hired for that job, both you and Tina will earn a reward. Now, you may be asking yourself, where exactly does this referral money come from? Whenever a successful hire is made, companies pay wanted 7% of the annual salary of the candidate out of which Wanted will reward both the candidate and the referrer. It's a win-win for everyone. In 2015, Wanted was launched in South Korea with the mission to connect the best talent to the best companies using referrals. Four years and $20 million of venture funding later, Wanted is now in five Asian countries, including Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. Our global leadership team consists of top talents from top global companies, including Accenture, Microsoft, LinkedIn, Line, Nexon, Citibank, and Samsung. And surprise, surprise, every one of these team members came to join the team through a personal referral. In Taiwan, we've begun to connect 60,000 professionals to over 200 companies. And there's approximately $20 million, Taiwan dollars, of rewards just sitting there waiting to be earned through referrals in Taiwan alone. But that's just the beginning. In partnership with Inside Taiwan, 
we've recently launched the Inside Jobs page, expanding our reach to over 2 million business professionals in Taiwan on a monthly basis. And by the end of summer, Wanted will also be available online. 19 million registered users on Line Taiwan, just like yourselves, will be able to refer your friends and colleagues to jobs for Line points in addition to the cash rewards. Today, Wanted connects top companies to top talents all across Asia. And in four short years, we've in increased our client base from some 100 companies in South Korea to over 5,000 companies Asia-wide. We've also increased our talent network to over 800,000 professionals, and we process over 800,000 job applications on a yearly basis. At the same time, our revenue growth has been accelerating year on year. We went from a monthly average growth of 4% in 2016 to over 20% in 2019. But we don't plan to stop there. Wanted has accumulated over 500,000 pass-fail data between job applicants and jobs. And we've been building up our machine learning algorithm to match candidates to jobs at a higher success rate. As the top-of-mind recruitment platform, Wanted will continue to grow and evolve until we become Asia's top social career platform. We will not only connect people to great jobs, but we'll continue to explore ways to make all of our lives at work more fulfilling and more enjoyable. Taiwan, don't settle for a cup of coffee or a meal any longer. I invite you to join Asia's referral revolution. Join us because you are wanted. Thank you. Hello. I'm Tony Ling. I'm a venture partner with Spark Labs Taipei. Um, you know, in the tech industry today, you hear a lot of terms. Uh, said over and over again, AI, IoT, big data. And while these technologies offer enterprises a huge opportunity to transform the way that they interact with their customers, transform the product and services that they provide for their customers, it creates problems also. And specifically, enterprises have to figure out how to manage this massive increase of information in ways that make the data usable, analyzable, and most importantly, secure. It's for this reason that we at Spark Labs are very excited to be partnered with Auriga Security, a company that has developed proprietary technology to help enterprises solve this problem. I'm not smart enough to explain the technology, I'll let the founder do that, but I can tell you from a business perspective, it's working. Um, and that is evidenced by the significant customer traction that they've developed to date, the revenue traction they have, which is very impressive. So without further ado, I give you the founder, of Arga Security, Henry Hill. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Henry. I'm the founder and CEO of Arga Security. Right now, every year, there are billions of personal records lost and millions of dollars lost due to cyber attacks. And as of now, in every 37 seconds, a hacker is compromising your system, believe it or not. And even with all of the defensive hardware and software in place today, we're still not able to compensate with all these attacks. And the cat and mouse game between hackers and security professionals still goes on right now. It's a game where speed matters, and we are losing the battle. The reason why we are losing a battle is because of information overload. In order for us to see the whole picture, we need to be able to collect a lot of data from a lot of different devices and pump it into an analytical platform to perform analysis on it. And so, for a single platform to do collection and analysis jobs, it's just way too much for it to handle. On top of that, in order for us to find the right digital fingerprint of a hacker, we need to be able to sift through the haystack of data. 
This has been a common problem for security professionals even now as of today. So we created ParseMe. It was first created when we actually ran into this issue ourselves, trying to consume a large amount of data and wasn't able to compensate with it. So with ParseMe, we were able to collect all the data into our system and actually sift it through and get the right data to the analyst at the time that it needs it. Now, the second problem we are trying to tackle is actually trying to find the data to extract. Now, this is a sample of a log file. Now, I'm pretty sure you can't tell what's going on over here. This is someone trying to log into your mail server. And if we are trying to just locate the email address that somebody's trying to get access to, it's kind of tough, okay? And in order to do that, we rely on something called regular expression. This is the sample of regular expression that we have to write in order to extract the data from the log sample that I just showed you. Kind of difficult, right? Now think about it. Your security prof uh, professionals and your analysts have to deal with this on a daily basis. So within ParseMe, we actually created an advanced data normalizer that's based on AI model that can actually allow the users to tag the data that they need, extract the data that they want, and send it out to the analytical platform that they used to without even writing a single line of code. So, ParseMe is doing all the heavy lifting for you, from data collection, all the way to the normalization process, from filtering to the last part of the storage. And all the data is actually being kept in our secure storage system, so it's temper-free from the possible hacking attempts. And finally, we give you the data at the time you need it when you need it. Now, efficiency and effectiveness is very critical in terms of data analysis. And how we stack up to our competition is just mind-blowing. Give an example. When we try to collect data, our competitor collects at about 8,000 to 12,000 events per second. And we can do it at the five times the speed at 60,000 events per second on the same hardware platform that they are using. And on storage, if we were to store three terabytes of data, which is the average size of the data that everyone else stores for about 90 days, competition will use up to 270 terabytes of data storage for them, and we only need 20 terabytes thanks to our advanced compression algorithm. Last but not least, getting the data to you in time is the critical factor. To process through 50 gig of data, competition would take somewhere around 360 minutes to finish processing it, where us, we only require 20 minutes and we're done with it. So our business model is rather simple. Aside from the sales of our product, we also provide professional service to our customers to give them additional insights to their data through visualization and other analytical means possible. And right now, our clients are actually finding even more creative ways to use our system. ParseMe right now for some of our clients can not only collect security data, they can actually collect IoT and OT equipment data right into our system and get the data that they want. And this is the reason why within the six months that we launched ParseMe, we have already gained some of the leading companies' recognition here in Taiwan, all the way from leading telecommunication company to one of the big four accounting firm here in Taiwan right now, crunching through terabytes of data for them, giving them the insight that they need and the power to expect the unexpected. And we don't end there. We are right now expanding our market globally at the moment with Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Macau. And we're right now estimating by the end of 2020, we'll have over 300 nodes of sales with over $8 million in revenue. Our team members are security professionals at heart, and we are from companies both local 
and globally recognized. And not only that, we regularly contribute to global security communities such as Open Web Application Security Project, Cloud Security Alliance, and also to security communities over here in Taiwan as well. With ParseMe's creation, this is only the first step of approaching to our final goal. We want to provide a hacker-free world and protect everyone from possible attacks. ParseMe, protecting the enterprises through precision analytics, assuring cyber resilience through innovation. Thank you. Let's现场一点点准备的时间 and I never like to admit that I was wrong And I've been so caught up in my job Didn't see what's going on, but now I know Okay, I'm now let's welcome Steven Johnson and moderator team Welcome Are you the only one Lost in the millions oh, I Hey, well, good afternoon. I hope you've had a great day. Um, we've seen a lot of very interesting ideas on stage. So now it's my great pleasure to talk to a man who, uh, who deals in ideas, who discovers ideas, and talks about uh, how ideas come to us. Stephen Johnson has published 11 books. Um, to be honest, I don't know if I've read that many books. Uh, he's very prolific. There is a theme through all of his work um, uh, he's probably his most famous book is How He Came to Now. Uh, one of my favorites is Wonderland, but I don't have favorites really. Um, they're all equal. He also, also is a podcaster. So it's hard to put him in any, any kind of box except I, I call him a, uh, a curious mind who shares his work with us. Um, and so we're going to talk today about innovation. That's what we're all here about, you know, in the startup land. It's all about trying to find innovation. So my first question, Stephen. Why do humans like to play? <laughs> well, thanks, Tim. Uh, first off, let me just say, before I answer that question, how great it is to be here and how wonderful this event has been. Uh, amazing demos and such great range of demos. So uh, congratulations to everyone involved. Um, and it's a real treat to be here. So play. Um, I, you, you mentioned uh, this book and podcast I did called Wonderland, um, which I, I started in kind of historian mode. I wanted to write a history of the way that people have had fun over the centuries and millennia and to talk about all the entertainment forms that we have in our lives today and who invented them and, and the history of that. And what I discovered as I was researching the project, really before I started writing it, is that while play is a, has a long history as part of what it means to be human, there is a really surprising and fascinating connection between play and innovation, and that there is a disproportionate number of big transformative ideas in society that originated with someone kind of messing around for the fun of it without some kind of high-minded purpose in, in mind. Um, and that, that's, that includes music. There's an incredibly interesting long connection between music and, and computers and technology. Um, uh, and it includes games. I mean, we think about um, the connection between artificial intelligence and, and chess and, and Go and games like that. Um, but I'll give you one kind of example, a little bit more detail, which, which is in that book. Um, there was a, a game, a video game created in, in 1962 um, called Space War. And this was arguably the first video game ever ever created. Um, those of you who are old enough to remember Asteroid. Anyone remember Space War? Anybody? Oh. Has anybody Asteroid. seen? Uh, yeah, there, there we go. It's All right, you've just shown your age. Thank so you there you go. I, I've actually, if you if you go to uh, Silicon Valley and the Computer History Museum, you can actually play Space War on a on a on a PDP one or whatever the computer is called that they have there. It's extraordinary. I actually played it with my 13 year old son, and uh, it's still surprisingly good. But it's a very streamlined game. 
and it was created by these engineers at MIT. They'd gotten this new, you know, kind of microcomputer in 1961, 1962, and the big new thing about this computer was that it had a it had a monitor for the first time, right? So there was a screen, so you could you could push pixels around. So this is back in the days where computers' output was punch cards. Right, right. right. So this was, this was the, the idea that there was a screen was was you know this revolutionary concept, and so they're trying to figure out what are we going to do with this screen? Like what 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 can we do to showcase the power of this new technology? And so they decided to create this game. And it was basically, if you, you know, it was a little spaceship and, you, and someone else piloted another spaceship and you went around a little sun that actually had a kind of gravitational field and, and you shot at each other and that was it. This, you can make the argument that this game, Space War, is one of the most important pieces of software written in the 1960s. It, it traveled around all the, you know, emerging computer science departments. People added to the code. It's really, the, in some ways, one of the beginning kind of core examples of open source software. No one owned it. People made it more efficient. They added features. They built a joystick to control your ship, which is actually one of the first devices ever to, to actually control an avatar on the screen that represented you. So it's a predecessor of the mouse. And eventually, it got it's so kind of rampant in the computer world that um, Stuart Brand, the great uh, kind of hippie and founder of the Whole Earth Catalog, uh, wrote about it, wrote about Space War for Rolling Stone magazine. And he had seen these people at play on these computers. And he thought, he saw how much fun they were having. And he thought, this is not what computers are supposed to be like. They're supposed to be boring. They're supposed this to be is big. back in the day where IBM had big, small computers with the size of a closet or a room. And you put all this time and money and millions of dollars into playing games? Right. It, it, computers were supposed to belong to big bureaucracies, the military, governments, big accounting firms. And he saw these people laughing and having fun. And from that experience, he said, there, he realized that, wait, there's something new coming. People are going to have a much more intimate relationship to computers. And he came up with this phrase in the early 1970s to describe that, which was the personal computer. And so when we say PC today, it's an echo of this vision that Stuart Brand had watching people play this game. And that vision, which he wrote about in Rolling Stone magazine, inspired another young hippie in the Bay Area to go start his own company. And that person was Steve Jobs founding Apple. Who himself came from a games company, Atari. Yeah, he, his first job was actually at Atari, yeah. right? And so, yes, when we look back at the history of computing, we can talk about its role in the military, and we can talk about all this stuff, but there is also a very rich tradition of people at play. And I think, I would say one last thing about it. We heard earlier in the panel before um, a really important point about the... the, the value of failure and, and the importance of kind of having a tolerance for risk. And I think one of the reasons why playful environments drive so much new thinking and new ideas and innovation is because when you're at play, f failure is an option, yeah. right? You, 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 you're comfortable, the stakes are low, and so you're freer to kind of experiment and to tinker and to come up with new combinations. And it's through that playful exploration that you often stumble across a, a, a really new and important idea that ends up being useful in a very practical way. And only in play, really, when you think about it, especially computer games, does risk absolutely get rewarded. Because in so many cases, if you don't take that risk, yeah. you're not going to win, right? And you can always respawn if you die, right? Everyone knows that in a first-person shooter. So the idea of pushing the boundaries is a it's fundamental tenet of play in games, isn't it? If you think about it, one of the things that define a game, as opposed to other forms of entertainment, is that it's always different every time yeah. you play it. A game that ends the same way or that follows the same pattern is not a game, right? It's right. a fixed narrative, right? And so, by definition, games, and I, w I think this is true of, uh, you know, of great art as well and of music, is that there's a level of surprise that makes things interesting to us. And there's a whole kind of neuroscience theory of why that is, why our brains are drawn to, towards these things. But it's one of the reasons why you know, innovative ideas come out of playful environments is because we're looking for surprise. We're looking for something that we haven't heard before, an experience we haven't had before. And that's what Space War drove these people to, to, to think about the computer in a new way because it was a new kind of experience. So if we then think about the concept of innovation, you know, there's a, a famous saying that necessity is the mother of invention, right? It's because we have a specific need, that's why we go out and we build something. Uh, you know, the space race was a classic example. NASA needed specific materials, so they spent billions of dollars, and you know, as the story goes, we get Teflon today. 
But from your work, it could also maybe be argued that, that perhaps amusement is also the mother of invention. Is, is it really the case that amusement will bring enough invention that will change the world? Or do we still need to have a specific goal in order to get to that technology or that innovation that's going to change things? I, th I think in a sense what one really wants in, in, in your individual life but also in an ecosystem or in an organization is in a sense a kind of mixed strategy, right? So you, you want to have goals. You want to have pro serious problems that you're trying to solve. Um, you you want to take on challenges that have real kind of consequences or value to society or to your customers or whatever it is. But at the same time, you want to keep alive that, that spirit of play and have those kind of outside interests or hobbies. Mm. Um, so many of the kind of great innovators that I've profiled in my work, one of the things that defines them is that they have a lot of hobbies. Yeah. They, they're working on a big problem, but on the side they do all these other things. And those side interests, those kind of playful interests, generate ideas or new connections or new associations that they wouldn't have otherwise had that they then bring back to their kind of their main project. So if you're, just to interrupt, if you're a Taiwanese boss and your staff are working till 9 p.m., 10 p.m., you're not going to get innovation out of them. Send them home and send them out to play because they're going to come back with great ideas, right? <laughs> You've heard it from us. <laughs> Go right. back to your boss and tell them that. You need to leave work by 6 o'clock to be a more innovative worker. Or, or, or the, the other version of that is let them bring the hobbies into yeah. work, right? So, so the great um, innovation design firm IDEO, um, that, you know, out of which things like design thinking came, came, you know, a company that spent years and years just doing innovation 24-7. Their co-founder told me years ago this thing that, that I loved, which is that for, since the beginning of that company, they're now this you know, massive kind of global company, from the very beginning, they have always had this tradition, which is Monday morning, senior management meeting, the very top brass of the company, get together to talk about you know, the clients they've landed or the deliverables they have that week or their Q4 projections or whatever it is. But before they do that, they have this ritual where they basically play a round of show and tell. <laughs> and what it is is they all come in and they, they bring in stuff that they saw or that they experienced. So they'll be like, oh, my, you know, I just came back from Japan and I found this weird little robotic doll that's interesting. Or I went to this sculpture exhibit the other day and look at this image that I found of this sculpture that I saw there. And the, this guy, Tom Kelly, was telling me about it. He was like, from a distance, it's indistinguishable from kindergarten. I know. Right? It's just like, hey, Back I to have elementary a school. Yeah. But, but what the, the, the reason they do it is that they're setting a tone at the highest level of the company, and, you know, in the C-suite, where they're saying, we know that if this is going to be a really innovative company, that you're going to find inspiration from these other places. And you're going to take those ideas and bring them in and turn them into something new in the context of your actual day job. And it's rewarding curiosity, exactly. especially outside of work. Exactly. That's cool. And they are, of course, a very innovative company. Right. One thing I want to ask you about in terms of you know, innovation, ideas, uh, and which leads into technology is we often hear about times when people have that eureka moment, that, oh my god, I know exactly what the technology be, should be, what the, what the process should be. And we make a big deal of that, right? We make a big deal of these big eureka moments. But that's not always how the best innovations come about. Sometimes it's kind of a slow burn bubbling of ideas. Talk to us about how that works. So th this is something I wrote about in this book years ago, it came out nine years ago, called Where Good Ideas Come From. And it came out of kind of studying cases in, in lots of different fields where people had been celebrated for having these transformative ideas. And as you say, like the, the, the classical way that we describe innovation is the eureka moment, right? We, we tell the story like the apple falls from the tree and it hits Newton on the head and oh, he has the theory of gravity like that. We love to tell stories like that. But in my research, the, the more I looked at people who had truly transformative ideas, the clearer it became to me that in fact, the, the eureka moment, that aha moment, we have all these words to s describe this, eureka moment, aha moment, light bulb moment, all, these, all this language. But in fact, that idea of a sudden inspiration is, is more often than not a kind of a myth or it's a fiction that we tell ourselves. We condense the true story down into this sudden inspiration. And the, and the biggest ideas, I think, take this different form, which is what I called in that book, the slow hunch, which is that they start with this feeling of there's something interesting out there, but you're not quite sure why, and you're drawn towards this idea, but you can't quite put your finger on what it is. And they stay in that state 
for months or for years. And, and there, like a wonderful example, this is Tim Berners-Lee, who is the kind of father of the World Wide Web, arguably the most important in innovation of, of certainly of my lifetime. And Berners-Lee did not have anything resembling a eureka moment. He started working as a programmer at CERN, the Swiss physics lab, in his, in his 20s. And he got this new job, and he was around all these Nobel laureates and brilliant people who were walking around in the hallways with him. And he decided to create this little application just to keep track of the people in the office. So he it was like building a little social network map of the people in his in, in, so at CERN. So Berners-Lee invented Facebook. <laughs> right. Well, well that, there, there's a footnote in that. Hold on, just hold that thought because that's a really important observation. But so he he creates this little app purely for his own use, and he's not he has no big ambition. He's just trying to like remember people's names, and he. When he meets somebody new, he creates a little entry for them, and if they're working on a project with somebody else, he creates a kind of a link between that person and the other and the other person. And if they have a paper that they've published, he creates a link to that, it's an icon kind of representing that paper. And it's a kind of rudimentary hypertext kind of system. And he uses this, you know, for years and kind of tinkers with it, kind of upgrades it a little bit, comes up with a new architecture. But, but he's for just it. using it himself, right? Yeah, it's just a si little side hobby thing. And then slowly, over five years, it begins to dawn on him that he maybe has stumbled across an architecture that could be more powerful than that. And, and there's this great moment where he has to go into his supervisors at CERN and have that awkward conversation where he's like, I believe I may have invented a global communications medium in my spare time. Oops. Uh, you know, can, I, can I focus on this now? You know? And so the point of this is, you know, you, again, it's like the, the idea of play. You have your day job, you have your responsibilities, you have products that need to ship, so you need to focus on those things. But if you only focus on those things and you don't keep those hunches alive kind of in the margins and, and write things down and revisit those hunches, you know, two years, three years later, because oftentimes the idea you had in 2019 only makes a little bit of sense in 2019, but when you re-encounter it three or four years later, because something has changed, or you've met someone else who has changed your perspective, or there's a new technology, suddenly that idea is radically transformed. So keeping those kind of hunches alive um, in your mind, and collectively in the organization too, like Just allowing people to share. Note-taking itself is a powerful tool, isn't it? Pick up your phone when you have an idea, use your notes app. Yep. Just write it down. Maybe you'll forget about it, but a few years later you might come across it again and suddenly it sparks it yeah. all over again. You know what? I want to I want to paint a picture for you. And if you're if you, this is familiar to anyone in the room, raise your hand. Sitting at a desk with a cubicle about this high, right? Who's who's ever worked in an office like that? Just you and your little cubicle. One person raising their hands. Basically, you can't see the person sitting next to you. The only time you see them is when you're sitting in a conference room, or maybe bump into them as you pass them on the way to the toilet, which is tucked around next to the elevator. You maybe have a coffee room in the side corner where you kind of go and make a, a cup of tea. But during the day, you don't actually see your colleagues very often. I'm, I know this is a common thing in Taiwan. I see it all the time in offices. And I want to ask your perspective. You know, you can put that vision in your mind. We often don't think about the physical space. We talk about Adios and, and other places. Talk to us about the importance of the physical space in which we work and how that matters to innovation in a company. Well, you know, I was thinking about, I mean, Edgar had this wonderful slide earlier where he, he was talking about the, the kind of it takes a village motto that's so important to Spark Labs and, and, and also the importance of collaboration, right? So I, I think we, we, uh, we live in a network age. We understand that it's no longer about the lone genius kind of working on their own and having the, that brilliant idea all on their own. So we understand on some level that collaboration is important. But have we created, as you say, physical spaces that encourage that kind of um, impromptu, serendipitous kind of discovery that come, that happens when interesting people gather together and have kind of open-ended conversations, that it's not just sitting in your cubicle alone, or maybe even worse, going into the conference room and somebody putting up a PowerPoint presentation, you know, for the three o'clock meeting. Oh, yeah. That's where ideas go to die, right? Everybody's just like, oh, yeah, let's sit through this bullet point presentation here. And, you know, that's, that's not a kind of creative environment. So how do you create, I, my model for it, it, you know, is instead of the conference room or the cubicle, it's the coffee house, right? It's the space where multiple conversations are going on 
Um, there's one group over here working on one problem. There's another group over here talking about something else. So, you know, this was the classic that I wrote about this a lot, the coffee houses of the 18th century and the 19th century that drove so much innovation during that period where people... But if I want to point out, if, if uh, sorry to interrupt, the government actually wanted to shut them down because they yeah. thought they were a waste of time, right? There's a great, yeah, there's a great... Um, when coffee came to London, and this, this is a little coffee history, if you're interested in this, so coffee came to London around 1660, and everybody went crazy for it, along with tea, basically. Coffee and tea come in around the same time. And all these coffee houses form, and suddenly all these people are not going to work. They're going and hanging out in these coffee houses and having these interesting conversations on caffeine, you know, this mm. new drug that everybody's obsessed with. And they were taking up so much time that Charles II, who was then king of England, uh, actually banned coffee houses, like issued this edict saying, you know, people, the line was, people are being distracted from their lawful calling and affairs, just sitting around drinking coffee all day long. And that ban lasted... And we've all been guilty of that, haven't yeah, we, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> That ban lasted one week, because already, like, the people of England were so addicted to their tea and their coffee. But the key thing is that he was wrong. It, it was, he, he looked at it as a, as a waste of time or as this frivolous thing, but in fact, almost every major idea in the 18th century has a coffee house somewhere in story. Te technological innovation, political innovation, ma the magazine business came out of there, the insurance industry, all of them came out of coffee houses. And so the question is, like, what is the version of that today? And, and one version of it, I think, is actually co-working spaces, right? I think are a wonderful example of getting people with different interests, working on different startups, um, sharing a space, having a, a coffee machine where they go hang out and make coffee and have these kind of serendipitous conversations where new connections are made. And the unscheduled free flow chance meetings, right? Yeah. That's kind of the key point, isn't it? And the, the other thing that I'd say about the space of our work environment. So one of the things that I've noticed going around and talking about innovation in different places, you know, everybody's like, how do we become like Silicon Valley? And sometimes I, I see this phenomenon, which I call like the foosball or the ping pong table problem, which is that these companies have heard that, you know, Google puts foosball tables and ping pong tables, you know, in the offices with its engineers. And that's part of the Google culture, the Silicon Valley culture. The foosball table will fix it. Yeah, yeah, so they're like, we put a foosball table in there, but we're still not innovative. And they're like, what is wrong? Like, what's going on? And it's, it, I, I think the, 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 you know, their, their heart is in the right place. But the point is that you want it, if you're going to create that environment that is a creative environment, you have to find things that are actually kind of like indigenous to the culture of the company. And... And, and integrate those and not just like drop down a foosball table and say, go crazy. And my favorite example of that is um, in, in Brooklyn, where I, where I live most of the year, um, there's a great company called Etsy. Uh, people probably know Etsy, some people know Etsy. It's a public company, um, kind of the Amazon for, uh, you know, handmade jewelry and, and, and you know, artisanal, art, artisanal goods. And they have their headquarters in Brooklyn. And if you go visit them, they have this wonderful thing, which is that while they don't, they're not in the music business at all. Their office is filled with musical instruments. Um, there's like a grand piano in one place. There's a there you know acoustic guitars strung around everywhere. Um, the meeting meeting rooms all have like music related names. There's an actual band room where you can go and play that's soundproof and stuff like that. And it came out of this idea that I, I gather if you work at Etsy and you live in Brooklyn, by definition you also have a like an indie rock band. That, right. you, that, that you're, you're in at the night. Hipster, so, you know, you're yeah. some kind of like hipster. And, and so they, they realized that that was part of the culture of the company. And so they created, the, they decided to embrace that. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, have all these instruments strewn around their office. And the idea is that you're kind of like, all right, we've got, we're crunching on this project. Like we've got this big presentation next week. Uh, we got to work hard on it, but let's just go and jam for 15 minutes just to clear our heads. And then we'll go, and then we'll go work on it. And it, you know, it creates this great atmosphere. And it's also, for everything we've just said about play, it creates a more creative I think atmosphere. the Taiwan version would be a KTV room in every office. Who, yeah. who, anyone in favor of that? <laughs> that would go down well. Um, but yeah, that's the idea of getting people together and, and playing together, right? Yeah. Um, the other question I want, I know we're running out of time. How are we going, Edco? Are we wrapping up yet? No, we're just going to, we've got another hour, is that right? <laughs> um, we can do it. I'm here. Um, uh, if you need, you can get a coffee. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you about the, the idea of diversity because, oh, yeah. Great. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard so much from, uh, especially Silicon Valley, they have a diversity problem. Um, and 
a lot of people just label it as just being politically correct. But it's more than being about politically correct. There is real benefits to having a diverse environment, not just of culture and gender, but even educational backgrounds, all sorts of backgrounds, different ideas. Talk to me about the practical examples of how diversity will improve innovation and a better workplace. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. It's such an important point, particularly given the political situation in our in the United States right now. So, um, a couple of thoughts on it. The, the, the first is, um, I, you're, one of the things that I think is not appreciated enough about Silicon Valley is it does have diversity problems in terms of, uh, if you think about ethnicity, in terms of African Americans and Hispanics, um, and in terms of engineering, it, it, there need to be more m women involved. But on the other hand, one thing that isn't said enough about Silicon Valley is that the tech sector in the United States, if you think about diversity of national origin, mm, is the true. most diverse industry in the United States. Yeah. So you go into those offices and it is filled with, it's filled with people from Taiwan, it's filled with right. people from Southeast Asia, it's filled with people from Eastern Europe, it's filled, you know, it's, it is a very cosmopolitan uh, culture there in that sense. And I think that is clearly part of its strength, right? There's no question that that diversity has been a tremendous um, boon, which is why our current immigration policies, as we've heard earlier alluded to, um, are, are such a disaster. Um, there is a, a, an almost endless body of research. This is one of the most robust findings in the social sciences of the last 20 years, which is that diverse groups are collectively smarter yeah. than homogeneous groups. And they, they, particularly when it comes to innovation and creative problem solving, that, that you, you put people who have either different gender, different ethnic, but also, as you said, different intellectual backgrounds, different professions, and get those people together, and they're, they're more likely to be, as a group, collectively smarter. I mean, the, the, the um, I've forgotten the name, was it EC? The, the um, skincare uh, product that was, that was demoing. Um, they were talking about just the range of, uh, of intellectual fields yeah. that had to come together to, to make that product, right? Um, and, and again, this is like the hobbies argument, that if, 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 you are, if, if you are in one kind of field, whatever the field is, whether you're you know, a, uh, you know, a, a doctor, an architect, or a software engineer, and you are only talking to other doctors or other software engineers, um, that is making you less innovative. That you wanna have an interesting like, pool of people um, around you who are working on different kinds of problems because you will f discover new ideas or new, new techniques or new metaphors, new ways of approaching problems from those kind of um, experiences. And so when we, when we make the argument for diversity, I think we're, we're too quick to just make the argument in terms of tolerance or equality of opportunity, all of which is important, but we should also remind ourselves that diversity is a value that we champion because it also makes us smarter, makes our organization smarter. And the, the other thing that I want to point out is that um, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the issue of, of this is that it's not saying that you know, locally born and raised Americans are less smart than, say, a Chinese or a Taiwanese or an Indian. No. It's the diversity of ideas that brings out the best in everyone. Um, and the reason why I point that out is that I know that in Taiwan, many people think, oh, we need to get foreigners in because, you know, oh, but, you know, that means that they're smarter than us. I want to point out that Taiwanese are amongst the best engineers and most innovative people in the world. But when you bring a diverse group of people from different backgrounds into your business, it's not saying that the foreigners are better than you. It's saying they're bringing a different idea to the table that can help bring out the best in you. And I think that's something that I really hope Taiwanese founders and managers will understand. And it's, it's also to point out that you don't need to be worried that foreigners are going to take your jobs because they're not. Uh, but they're going to make your jobs better and, I, I believe, help you get better pay too, which, uh, well, who's not going to say no to that in Taiwan? So that's one thing that I really want people to understand is that diversity is not about one group being better and another one being less and learning from them. It's about the collective kind of rising tide lifts all boats, right? And, and that happens, I think, it's a great point. I mean, and, the, and the other thing about it that I would say is that, that you know, that happens on a um, regional level as well as in the level of kind of the office mm. or, or you know the team meeting, right? So there was a great panel earlier about Silicon Valley today, um, and I thought as I was listening to it, you know, one of the great questions is why did Silicon Valley happen in the first place? Yeah. Like why did this this place become so 
uh, the, the epicenter of innovation in, in the world, in the world economy. And one of the reasons is, is that the Bay Area and around San Francisco in the 60s and 70s and early 80s was this very interesting confluence of, of really kind of three different cultures, right? You, had, you actually had a, a military culture that was there because of the Bay itself. People thought that the Bay was going to be invaded, and so you had all these, you know, kind of military people. And then you had a, a, a kind of an engineering tradition that came out of that, and you had the great education tradition of Stanford and Berkeley and those schools. But crucially, you had a bunch of hippies. You had the counterculture, right? I mean, Steve, Steve Jobs, Jobs hippie, again, he was, didn't wear shoes for like 10 years, you know? And the, the, you cannot tell the story of Silicon Valley without talking about the counterculture. Because all those folks who were in the homebrew computer club, if you see that group, it looks like a Grateful Dead reunion. You know, if you look yeah. at the pictures of them, and, and that combination of like engineering chops, like technical know-how, and a kind of radical, the world can be reinvented with new tools in a completely new form that, that came out of the counterculture, that's, that was the, the unique cocktail that the Bay Area had at that particular moment in time. And I think that we, in, in fact, it's one of the arguments, in addition to the you know, housing costs and salaries and all this stuff that people worry about is that it, the, the, the culture has become too dominated just by the tech sector. Yeah, and it's yeah. lost some of that um, eclectic quality that it had. And that may be an advantage for other cultures that, that are, are actually more kind of diverse in terms of their professions and industries. You, you touch on another point that I, I want you to talk about is that there is this belief that tech is the only area you're going to find innovation, right? So many VCs and funds and startups are focused on tech, new apps, new software, new hardware, all these things. We always think about tech as being the place where innovation happens, but, but that's just not correct. There is innovation well outside of tech, isn't there? And we want to, yeah, we want to remind ourselves of that. Uh, you know, I did this, this book in this show called How We Got to Now a couple of years ago, and we did a whole episode on the innovation of clean drinking water in large cities. Right? I mean, you know, if 100... That is so mundane. 100, <laughs> 100 years ago, if you lived in a city of 15 million people, which you couldn't even do back then, but if you lived in a city of 3 million people, um, you know, there were terrible water problems, and you could die of cholera in 48 hours just from drinking water out of a tap. Um, and in most of the world now, we have solved that problem, and that was, in, I mean, of all the innovations, right? That, the, 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 the spread of clean drinking water in large communities around the world is, is arguably right up there with the World Wide Web and, mm -hmm. and the internet in terms of life-transforming innovations. But we don't celebrate that as much because, you know, no one made $10 billion from it's it, and there's sexy, no Mark Zuckerberg, you know, he's the guy in a hoodie, and he's, you know, he's changed the world. And so I think as a culture, it's one of the things I've tried to do in terms of the books that I write and things that I make is to remind ourselves that there is a whole, uh, there's a wider spectrum of innovation out there. And there, there, there are more problems to be solved in, in, in that world as well. Um, that is one of the important things that I think need, people need to think about is it doesn't have to be just in your domain, right? You may be, especially, you may be doing hardware and kind of tinkering in software. But there'd be, there could be food or some other area that you could be interested in that could apply to what you're doing. Or you may just dump all of that and go off into another sector. And you can get a lot of innovation from stepping outside of tech. And I know that Taiwan is so strong in tech, but there is a lot of innovation to be had outside of that. And I, I hope that people in the room uh, understand that. And I hope the VCs will be thinking that too, will be realizing that not everything has to be tech focused. Uh, because if you've got a good innovative idea, there can also be money to be made from it, which, well, it's not always the major goal, but, you know, when you're talking to a VC and you're trying to get some from funding, they want to see some that, money that being helps. made, right? That helps. It does <laughs> help. Uh, we, we're kind of running out of time. Uh, I, we could sit up here for another half hour, but uh, I know that uh, we don't have that long. I want to kind of uh, finish up by asking, Stephen, your next projects. Your most recent book was Farsighted, which is a continuation of a lot of the themes that you've you've written about before. So, you know, tell us quickly about Farsighted, the, the key takeaways from that, and what you're working on next. I've never had so, so many projects at one point in my life, actually, so I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm living according to what we were talking about before, about having lots of things that influence each other. But Farsighted, which I believe is coming out here um, in, once it's translated, um, is about creative decision-making and complex decisions and long-term thinking. Um, so and it talks a lot about diversity and the importance of that. Um, I'm working on a uh, the, kind of the most important project I would think to this 
audience is I'm working on a book and hopefully a television series uh, about really the most extraordinary thing that has happened over the last hundred years, if not you know, the, the history of human beings, which is that we globally doubled life expectancy uh, in the last wow. hundred years. So basically, globally, the life expectancy was about 41 or 42 hundred years ago at the end of the World War I and the Spanish uh, flu, and today it's pushing up around 80. That is as big an achievement yeah. uh, a, a, as you can measure. And so this project is trying to wrestle with how did we do that? And what were the, what, who were the real innovators behind that? What were the institutions that made that possible? Um, it's a very, it's an epic story. So that will hopefully come out in about a year and a half. <laughs> we're going to be far-sighted to wait for that one. <laughs> yeah. So finally, how can people find your work? Obviously, uh, Amazon.com, I would assume, but uh, yeah. you're yeah. doing so many different things. I will recommend, if I can just butt in and say, go to his podcasts. Um, he's got what, two series, Wonderland from a few years ago, and you've got a current series going on. They're fantastic. But also the books, uh, 11 books, go out and buy them all as a box set. Uh, how else can they find your work? Yeah, so the new podcast is called American Innovations, so you can search that wherever you listen to podcasts. And, uh, and I'm Stephen B. Johnson on Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, searching up the books um, would be great. Thank you all. I've had a lot of fun. I'm very privileged to be up on stage. Thank you, for Edgar, thank for you inviting me. Um, and I wish all of you would have the chance that I do. But please thank uh, Stephen for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. A lot of fun. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Tim. It's time to thank everyone. Like, stay until the end of our demo day. And it's definitely not easy to uh, help startups go international. Uh, we definitely need everyone in the house to support each other and to seek for the next uh, big growth. So remember what I back to my opening remark. Founders is always difficult. They're having a like, tough time. They, made a, they, they have been meeting a lot of challenges, criticism, and also like just a lot of things that they need to get through. So uh, it definitely takes a village to raise a child. If you want to be part of Sparkless family, contact us. And if you are sort of founders, try to go global, please apply Spot Labs Taipei, the third cohort. It's already official on our Facebook fan page. And we hope that you can be the, be the next team that pitching on stage and be the next investor, invest in our company, and it'll be the next sponsor to our demo day event. Thanks again for coming by. Spot Labs Demo Day 2 successfully closed. Yeah, finished. Thanks a lot. Oh, one more, one more. Alright, Yesan. Oh,